Great. So I'm Daniel, and I'm also Keith, and uh, we're talking about free desktop. Um, Keith couldn't make it as he's still stuck in Portland, um, but I sent him the slides last night, and he didn't say that he was unhappy about having his name on them, so uh, I think this is okay. Um, I wanted to kind of, it started off, the title was Free Desktop Update. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time now walking back over uh, some of the history because there's you know, quite a few newer contributors these days, which is great. And some of the, some of the things about Free Desktop on the face of them uh, only make sense with the benefit of hindsight and some history. Um, some of them still don't, but are a little more understandable. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd, I'd run through how we got to where we are today and then a bit more of a future looking what we're planning to, uh, to do about where we are. So <clears throat> originally uh, Free Desktop was founded in uh, 2000 uh, by a GNOME developer called Havoc Pennington um, and a couple of other people from other desktops like uh, Waldo Bastion from KDE. And the idea was that it would be a space for stuff all of the desktops needed to do the same way in order to make a vaguely coherent experience. So when you're running a GT a KDE app under GNOME using Sawfish as your window manager, uh, you wanted the three of those to be coherent. Um, <clears throat> and so they spent a lot of their early time uh, sort of picking up where the X consortium left off in terms of uh, specking desktop interop. And so those were things like uh, drag and drop and copy and paste, clipboard managers, and it was kind of this uh, collection of text files as specs where everyone agreed on various behaviors and um, how to implement them the same way. After that, you know, it really picked up, like it was a very, very good time for that kind of inter-desktop collaboration stuff. Um, you know, everyone was mostly aiming the same way and uh, quite positive about things. Um, and so, you know, the, the drag and drop and the clipboard developed into things like uh, mime type handling and how do you open a file, what do you open a file with, um, into theming, uh, both icon, sound, color theming, um, really extended beyond that into all sort of along similar lines. And then at some point when it got beyond just being a place to, uh, to dump some HTML specs, um, it grew a CVS uh, server for hosting code, um, which is where things definitely started to change. In parallel to this, um, we had around 2003, I want to say, um, a very short-lived site called xwin.org. Um, and at the time in developing actual X11, the X consortium effectively didn't exist. Um, you know, all of the X development that happened was either uh, done by companies like Sun, HP, and Digital internally, or it was done by X386. But X386, even at the time when I was trying to uh, work on the packaging for Debian and Ubuntu, um, I didn't have good access to source and development trees. The way to contribute to X11 was uh, you sent to patches at x386.org uh, whatever you wanted to have. That was a closed list. So patches just disappeared into the core team void somewhere. They got discussed by people with no archive or record or way to contribute that. And it was becoming more hostile as well. Um, the watershed was X386 4.4, um, where they changed the licensing to be it seems like deliberately incompatible uh, with some of the other open licenses. And so at that stage, uh, Keith and a few other developers started xwin.org as a kind of discussion group. Um, 
it was essentially a big forum of uh, people getting together and saying, all right, so what should we do with X11 now? And yeah, things really picked up pretty rapidly from it being a forum. Um, you know, it wasn't long before everyone had jumped on board XWIN. Like from my perspective as a packager, having the ability to talk to the developers was some kind of like unprecedented wonder. Um, and there were a lot of people who felt the same way. So it had picked up this critical mass and we forked the, we kind of merged the two trees of the X consortium's last tree and uh, X386's last usefully licensed release as well. And people started contributing their own uh, fixes and improvements and what have you. And um, we released X11R 6.7, um, the first in a string of really unwieldy release names for us, or release versions. Um, and before long, we'd uh, built it into this quite fully fledged uh, X.org foundation. Um, that was all originally done under the auspices of the open group, um, which is, yeah, kind of a uh, slightly ironic name since they're extremely closed. Um, they're a, a pay to play closed shop vendor organization. And that's where X was when we started. The, the remnants of the X consortium, such as the, the trademarks, the domain name, um, all of this. But luckily, to be fair to them, uh, the open group were good enough or happy enough to see the, the back of us um, that they let us take all of that and uh, spin it out as the X.org Foundation where, um, yeah, we were actually able to do everything in the open and in this kind of studiously vendor neutral way because uh, we'd all been burned so hard by X11 just being beholden to vendor and corporate interests. And so at the time, largely the same people or a big intersection of people working on largely the same things was X.org and Free Desktop. So it made sense for the two projects to merge. Um, and part of that was practical concerns, like running a CVS server wasn't really that much fun, so it was much easier for X.org to just use free desktops. So we just discontinued xwin.org completely, and free desktop had absorbed uh, the development that was going on there. So by this stage already, we have um, X11 forked away, and um, free desktop hosting the x.org foundation projects, which is still the situation we have today. More that was going on, none of the desktop stuff stopped. So around that time, uh, 2004, -ish, the XDG name was born for cross desktop group. Um, and that was things like how to auto start applications, um, moving away from every distribution and every window manager having its own way to um, do your application menus into the unified uh, .desktop files and so on. Um, it was a pretty steady and obvious evolution of what Free Desktop had already been working on as a uh, coherent collective group. And that's the point in hindsight where it started getting really out of hand. Because, um, as I said, running a CBS server, especially a relatively high volume one, uh, wasn't a fun thing to do. And for some reason, a lot of people didn't want to do it. Um, so they, they tended to come to Free Desktop and ask for hosting. We tended to say yes. Um, it was... <laughs> yeah. It was a kind of odd parallel where on one hand we were throwing out hosting like it was almost uh, SourceForge or something. You know, it, it was very, very non-discriminatory. So 
anyone who had some kind of project idea and was about to announce a logo contest could um, apply to Free Desktop to get hosting, and we'd definitely say yes. But then, on the other hand, at the same time, um, we had this idea that one of the most useful things we could do would be to pull all the specs that we'd been working on together, um, pull a bunch of the software projects we were hosting together, and coalesce them as this, uh, like the Linux standards base has its various projects. We thought Free Desktop could be the same for the desktop, um, so there was a push to have this kind of platform-like SDK. Um, turns out we were maybe about 12 to 13 years too early, because uh, Flatpak now has the Free Desktop SDK, which is a very, very similar thing. But at the time where we tried to push this idea of a coherent platform that ISVs could target, um, we got essentially no interest and in, uh, traction externally. Um, in hindsight, maybe that's because we didn't include a toolkit with that, um, which, you know, picking a winner there wasn't really something that we could credibly do. Um, but after that, that uh, kind of set the direction for us. It made it fairly clear that people weren't interested in having Free Desktop be a, a low-level platform vendor and that the best place for us was just to be facilitation and infrastructure, really. So all of the uh, all of the efforts towards, uh, yeah, anything more than just making some standards and trying to bring some uh, people together just went on hold. Um, at that point, we're a bit bereft of direction, and also it was a busy time in X, so. <laughs> Most of the uh, people such as myself and Keith were just busy hacking full-time on X and we weren't really paying much attention to um, Free Desktop as a coherent project. It was just a random space. So rather than being like the Linux standard space, it was kind of another source forge to an extent. Um, but by this stage, we'd already, we'd all, already accumulated enough of a diverse collection of projects that no one was really sort of covering all of the different projects and had a decent uh, global view of what was going on. Um, we'd already taken on a number of communities who really had nothing to do with Free Desktop as an organization and vice versa, we left them alone um, apart from when they filled up our disk or something. Uh, that was most of the time that we talked to them. And yeah, by, by 2009, the, the rot had definitely started to set in. Um, we took our previous open policy towards projects where we'd accept anything and started um, handing out root on all the machines the same way. Um, anyone who vaguely expressed an interest in being an admin was given root, um, essentially. And everyone was doing their own little bits here and there. Uh, they'd come along with a need from their project, they'd set up some kind of service, and then they'd vanish, and we'd have no idea what was actually done. Um, it's completely fair to say we had no idea what was running on the machines a lot of the time. Um, I was surprised quite a few times to discover services running I'd never heard of. Um, and at that time, we didn't have a good way for people to discuss with Free Desktop as a wider project, um, you know, what was going on with their project or what were their needs. Um, and even if there was a good and well-defined place to do it, um, sort of no one really wanted to, you know. We we tried the anarchic cooperative uh, method of um, running that project. 
and yeah, around uh, a couple of years down the line, um, it started to degenerate a bit. It was the infrastructure we had was becoming quite unreliable. Um, we had a couple of disk and physical machine failures. Um, and those had really goaded us into fixing up the infrastructure. So um, we took on uh, Tolof, who was the admin at Collabora at the time. Um, and myself and Rob were also doing admin. So we decided the best thing we could do uh, would be to get someone who knew what he was doing to help us out. And Tolof began dealing with a lot of our infrastructure technical debt. Um, at the same time, I, <laughs> I relented after a fair few years of actively trying to avoid admin work and took that on as well. Um, and Keith started to change his focus a little bit from working on purely project technical issues to starting to take more of an interest in the community side and free desktop again as a kind of umbrella organization. Um, I think this is around the time we set up the free desktop LLC as a formal organization so we could hold some cash which was mostly to buy replacement servers every couple of years. Um, yeah, we had, there was Joe, Rob, Adam and Eric, there were a fleet of other admins from time to time who would come in and uh, come in and help us out. Yeah, around a couple of years ago, we'd um, yeah we we were in a pretty bad place. <laughs> um, you know, by this stage, it was really unclear what free desktop was actually for because. By 2015, GitHub was established as a place where you could host your code and contribute. Um, GitLab, we'd already been through Gatorius and all these other services. And it was really unclear what uh, Free Desktop actually offered over any of these services because uh, we didn't have any kind of coherent project structure or mission aside from something very vaguely about the desktop. Um, and our services were mostly objectively worse. So we just kind of left the projects to um, deal with themselves and all of the time we spent on free desktop was just treading water and paying down technical debt. Um, spent a lot of nights just running through uh, consolidating services and that was where I started to find a trend of projects whose websites we'd hosted or code we'd hosted. Um, I'd check to see whether it was still current or I'd be looking at usage stats or something. And I'd find that uh, those projects had actually moved off our infrastructure a couple of years ago. Um, but they hadn't told us, which is probably fair enough because we hadn't spoken to them in that time either. Um, and that was pretty concerning from an organizational point of view. I mean, it's not a sign of good health that people wander off and you find out about it a couple of years later. Um, so we started to look at what can we do um, to offer them more, uh, to stop projects leaving for places like GitHub and GitLab if there was still something we could offer. So we stood up services like uh, Fabricator and Jenkins um, in the hope we could get better issue tracking, better code review, CI, um, all of these kinds of dazzling modern features. Um, and last year was the first inflection point um, where our infrastructure was now completely stable. Uh, we'd spent a lot of time uh, going through just aggressively trying to make our services more reliable um, more stable and more coherent. And yeah, the, we got to a good enough point where we had the time and the bandwidth to start thinking about our community issues as well. Um, so this is when we sat down and decided to introduce the code of conduct. 
um, on the grounds that we were already legally liable for some of the content. So we did spend time already removing uh, things that were obvious copyright infringements or uh, spam about issues that if we left up would probably get my door kicked in in the morning. Um, so we figured that since we're legally <laughs> liable for that kind of seriously objectional, objectionable content anyway, then as a platform we should really be taking a stand that, you know, <laughs> we, we're not going to be responsible for uh, people leaving the community because they've been treated so badly. And then, GNOME as well were in the middle of their transition to GitLab or just about to begin and we had some really, really long discussions with them um, as they were trying to pick the tool that they would use as their uh, code hosting, issue tracking, code review platform. Um, myself and a couple of others got involved in those um, not to come up with a common, um, common solution for the both of us but just since we were running through the same issues with the same concerns, figured we might as well talk at the same time. Um, they ended up deciding on GitLab and independently, so did we. So, yeah, as I stand here now, it's, it's an open and neutral collaboration space. We own all of our uh, infrastructure. It runs on free services, we're not beholden to particular vendor or a project or corporate interests. There's no danger that free desktop's going to get acquired by someone and uh, will shut the whole thing down instantly. Um, it is still this, this very, very loose collection of projects who are not necessarily all moving in the same direction. So I'd kind of sum it up as we've consistently had good intentions. Sometimes we've delivered a useful service and you know there are obviously people who still think that we provide something of some value but it's not always come off. So yeah, as a, to put some numbers to that, um, depending on how you count, um, we have 42 things that we would call independent software projects, so their own community who are fairly active and healthy and continuing development as much as they need to. We've got, yeah, 28 projects which for the last five plus years there's been absolutely no activity. Some of them have been forked away elsewhere. Um, we've got 30 projects which never made it off CVS into Git um, so they are definitely dead by now. And <laughs> whilst I was uh, going through working uh, through the migration to GitLab, one of the things I did was take stock and uh, take a list of what projects we had um, and what they were up to these days. And yeah, I found that 31 of them had just moved somewhere else and we didn't know about it. Most of these went to GitHub, the vast majority. So yeah, we offer all of the usual services you'd expect from a hosting platform. Um, we haven't been able to provide a lot of the services people are asking for, like uh, CI or you know some good webhook integration when they push a commit or something like that, um, or modern code review. But we like to think that we're at least quite nice about it when we say to people that we can't do that, and we'll explain to them why and that we hope to do better in future, so that's a plus point. Um, beyond that, it's not super clear what we offer to the projects. So, yeah, service-wise, <laughs> in terms of Bugzilla and mailing lists, um, that and CI were the big three as to why people we spoke to said they were moving to GitHub. They said these things are no longer optional for them as a project. Um, which doesn't mean that everyone has to move like each project can make their own decision as to the best workflow, but not offering that just isn't an option for us if we want to remain even remotely relevant as a platform for people these days. 
Um, in terms of what we offer to our projects uh, and their interactions with us, um, up until now, adding an account has required filing a request on Bugzilla um, with a GPG key. <laughs> and you have to wait for an admin to get around to doing it, which often means knowing who they are and pinging us personally on IRC. Um, we don't do anything with the GPG keys in terms of trust. Uh, we kind of use Bugzilla as an authentication mechanism and hope that the real name is reliable. Um, so having things like external identity providers, being able to use your uh, Google account, um, I use my Google account for GitLab because I trust them to have a better idea of when someone's trying to impersonate me or break into my account than uh, I do, to be honest. And providing things like two-factor authentication as well is something we really need to do uh, just from a community responsibility point of view because uh, we host a lot of code that a lot of people run. So yeah, we... We landed on GitLab. Um, there's a long explanation on the free desktop mailing list and on my blog as to the judgments and uh, decisions we took along the way to end up there. But we discarded Fabricator after trialing it out because the UI just didn't work for us and we could see that project becoming ever more closed. Um, GitLab you know, they have a commercial offering at gitlab.com, but they're an actual open project. You can go on their issue tracker, you can talk to them. Um, code doesn't just get thrown over the wall uh, because they internally run everything through their open issue tracker and open MRs. And they've been really open and responsive to uh, us and Gnome and a lot of other projects who have a fairly different way of looking at open source development than what they were used to, but they've been really, really open to taking our viewpoint, which is good, and they genuinely care about open source and open projects run in an open way as a thing, which is super positive. But, you know, the, <laughs> the software also works really well, which helps. So, we couldn't do GitLab on our existing machines. Uh, they're close to life expired, and setting up a new fleet of machines is just not something we had the time to do, whilst also maintaining our existing services and trying to uh, get people migrated to GitLab. Um, so GitLab, the company, uh, quite generously offered to sponsor us for a year-ish. Um, to get us running on a Google Cloud platform um, with the idea that we'd be scouting around for other sponsors to pay our hosting bills, potentially on another platform. Um, but that allowed us to break the deadlock a little bit by not having to worry about the actual machines and administering them, but we could actually uh, just use the cloud to run the services that we have. Um, that's what I thought. Now I know what the cloud actually is and how to run services on it. Um, that took quite a while because it turns out Kubernetes is really complex, but um, trial and error got us there and it's a fairly stable and reliable service by now. Um, and it has the nice property of, unlike our existing fleet of machines, not consistently being inaccessible for half an hour every morning from Europe. Around 8.30, the uh, network routing just falls into a hole. And PSU have been very, very generous in giving us free hosting uh, physically for the last 14 to 15 years, but their network isn't quite up to scratch. Um, so yeah, we, we have got the vast majority of our projects uh, moved over to GitLab, which is really good. Um, there's a couple of smaller ones and a couple of bigger ones. Um, the kernel needs to wait until we can do a fairly big infrastructure change and update, so we can make sure that we're not going to be DOS'd by the, <laughs> the load of people trying to clone huge kernel trees uh, through GitLab. Um, that's moving from vertical service scaling to 
uh, horizontal, where we can spread all our services across, um, excuse me, across different machines. Um, there's a GitLab issue on the free desktop project which uh, tracks our progress, and yeah, we're, we're pretty close. Um, yeah, here's some more stats. Um, the Git repos aren't quite as big as you'd think they'd be, even the kernel. Um, turns out Docker registry images, like people really love those. Um, we've got, what is it, five times, six times <laughs> as much space dedicated to uh, storing uh, people's uh, Docker image builds for CI as anything else, um, which is a good thing, people are actually using it. Um, in terms of where our traffic goes, to be honest, it's a bit less than I thought, um, but once the the kernel repos come over, I imagine that'll change pretty dramatically. But interesting is that we've got more European than US traffic, or at least Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Um, so this is another reason why we wanted to move away from West Coast US hosting because it turns out the speed of light is actually sometimes the limiting factor um, in terms of latency in particular, so uh, yeah. And Australia is actually marginally represented there, which makes me happy. Right, so looking forward a little bit um, in terms of community bits, and yeah, again, what sets us aside from SourceForge or GitHub or something like that, um, yeah, it's around 500 US a month that we pay for uh, GitLab hosting. That's paid for or sponsored by GitLab themselves. We've got several thousand US dollars in the bank. Um, and that's about it as far as community governance and transparency goes. Um, we don't have much more to, uh, to offer if you ask us particular things we'll happily answer, but, you know, <laughs> this is as organized as we get in terms of uh, being transparent towards the community and allowing people to participate in free desktop itself, um, which doesn't seem like it's great and something we should fix. So, again, firstly, we, we need to define what we're doing for who and why. Um, we need to make it clear to projects what they can expect from us and in return what we expect from them. Um, and ideally, all of this shouldn't just be the same couple of people who are there by default because they've stuck around for 14 years. Um, so we're looking at opening it up and trying to get some kind of accountability and you know, also really an elected type uh, position as well, which, you know, it, it's very, very similar to uh, what the X.org Foundation have done. So yeah, I mean, they've been around since about the same time. They're also, like us, a software in the public interest is their legal umbrella project. Um, but, you know, they've got a board that's elected. They have actual meetings and they do things. Um, they're very open and clear about what they do, and they allow uh, people to participate. They also run a very good conference. <laughs> so yeah, if it's so great, why don't we just marry it already? Um, actually seems like a fairly reasonable idea. Um, you know, there's such a huge over, overlap between what Free Desktop and what X.org do that as a straw man, why don't we actually bring Free Desktop in under the X.org Foundation's umbrella? Um, there's a few open questions which aren't rhetorical. These are actual questions here. Um, in terms of the X.org Foundation has a, a clearly and relatively narrowly defined mission. Um, you can look it up. It's, they're quite good about communicating <laughs> what they actually do. Um, but Free Desktop has projects like Poplar, a PDF renderer, um, 
modem manager for your uh, cellular modems. Uh, in the past, we've hosted projects like LibreOffice as well. Um, so the core question I can see is, does the foundation kind of widen the scope of what it considers in its interest and what it will actively work for and try to serve? Or does the foundation keep its current mission the same and say, we'll absorb free desktop and the free desktop projects that are already in scope for us are still in scope for us and we'll keep the services going. Other projects which don't fit into that, um, they wouldn't be part of the foundation or necessarily cared for per se, but I guess sort of make it clear to them what they can expect for the uh, foundation providing them services. And then also, you know, free desktop as a hosting platform, what measure of independence does that have? Uh, things like when people say, can I host my project on free desktop? Who ends up saying yes or no for that? Um, those, those are kind of the bigger questions, but other than those, it seems fairly obvious to just bring free desktop in under the uh, Zorg Foundation umbrella, and that would solve all of the community problems we have without just pointlessly duplicating all the work. Yeah, it turns out the board can't actually do everything. So one thing we talked about is delegating very specific uh, responsibilities and powers, um, such as, you know, being the admin for this bit of the infrastructure and service we run. Um, also, the uh, code of conduct uh, administration and who answers to that is something that could potentially be delegated away by the board, but in a very specified way, making it clear who's responsible for what and why. In terms of the code of conduct, since we're here, um, it's currently myself, Keith, and Toloff that uh, deal with any uh, COC complaints. Um, ideally, we like projects to do it themselves rather than having us um, kind of tell them exactly what to do, but there is an escalation point needed, ultimately, and that's us. Um, and one of the things we've become pretty aware of this year, uh, especially with a lot of the recent hysteria about the uh, Colonel's Code of Conduct, is that we should really offer some kind of transparency into what we're doing uh, with the Code of Conduct and what happens when uh, you have a COC report. Um, so we've been looking at, there's several projects, including uh, Drupal, who uh, publish some kind of stats in some kind of form. We've been looking at that, uh, trying to figure out the best answer. And um, every single person we spoke to uh, said, could you please just do it in one slide at the very end of your talk at XDC uh, in the morning where most people are asleep? Um, and we're happy to do that. So. Since we introduced the COC last year, uh, we had a few trolls and just flat out abuse. Um, we've had three actual reports. Two of them, we decided there was nothing there to do. One of them, we went and had a fairly long private discussion with someone and uh, suggested he might want to change the way that he deals with people, and that was fine. Um, there's been nothing further than that. So yeah, in terms of just a, a bit of a to-do list, uh, stuff we would like to do better but need some actual help with. Um, our website definitely needs some work and I am not that person to do it. Um, I tried to theme this slide presentation a little bit with CSS earlier and ended up deleting the whole thing and going back to the simple theme, which is why it looks like this. Um, we need some help with cloud admin stuff like uh, monitoring and logging in particular. So if you are that person who knows how it works and has some time, that would be great. Um, corralling the specs and the standards we have and uh, getting a coherent list of them and making it more accessible to 
people who might want to use them would be great. Um, helping out our projects is always good, just giving them a bit of guidance. Um, yeah, please uh, file some issues on GitLab on the free desktop project. If you see something that needs work, we're happy to discuss. Um, I've already filed quite a few, uh, so some of this stuff is already discussed on there. Um, so if you want to get involved, I would recommend going to the free desktop project issues page uh, on our GitLab instance. And that's where we document as much as we can. Um, right, to the extent we still have time, which I don't think is much. <laughs> um, yeah, if you have questions or exclamations or statements at a push, I'm happy to take all of those. Hi, so what's the backup story? Uh, it, do we depend on the cloud? And what happens if the cloud evaporates? Um, all of our non-GitLab infrastructure is backed up onto what was originally tape, but might not be tape these days somewhere at Portland State. Um, our GitLab stuff is, part of it is stored in Google Cloud Storage. Um, and that has kind of retention and uh, auto backup supplied to that. And then everything that isn't already in cloud storage, which is mostly the uh, SQL database and the, excuse me, the actual Git repos, um, those get backed up into, again, Google Cloud Storage uh, every day. We keep about a week's worth of backups and I check it fairly constantly to make sure that the size of the backups increases rather than decreases. Any other question? Oh yeah, we've got, I think currently we've got close to 300 gig of backups for GitLab. Um, do you need any help from organizations like uh, machines to run GitLab workers or machines to actually run GitLab and so on? Is there anything that... Um, yeah, yeah, CI is something I skimmed a bit over. Um, we need to do a lot of CI running, like even just building Mesa uh, involves building LLVM sometimes. So that turns out to be ferociously expensive. Um, there is an issue on the free desktop project issues page about getting more GitLab runners. Um, having some sponsored would be excellent. Um, we've got a couple of sponsors already and I'm waiting for an email today that, uh, hopefully today, that says we should be able to stand up some more powerful runners, but that's something, yeah, we can always use help with. So yeah, check out the issue. Um, do you plan to have your projects uh, work closer together because especially the point you had with your different standards that have to be crawled, I remember reading a few with more or less the same scope in different states just lying around and it's really not clear which one is used at all. Is one standard just exists and KDE put it out there but they are the only one using it so effectively it could go to KDE and not beyond FDO where people might assume it's actually used by at least KDE and GNOME and yeah, the entire standards and what is actually used and by whom are there plans to get this out on the website? Yeah, I, having them actually catalogued somewhere coherent with a real status is like the least we can do. Um, where we're trying to figure out what's the way to do that that's the kind of least maintenance, uh, easiest catalog. Um, I, yeah, we've, we've had a couple of failed attempts at doing that. I can talk to you more about later. Um, in terms of getting people to work closer together or getting projects to work closer together, I think it's a good idea personally, but you know, I, I can't 
stand here and say that it's free desktop policy that all projects will work closer together because I don't know if they feel the same way. <laughs> so it, it's a much longer term discussion, I think. Uh, not a question. Just wanted to say that as mainly a user of FTO, I've always been very glad over the years that it's been there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so. Got one back there. <laughs> hey, good morning. My question is about, uh, let's say, uh, people not knowing, let's say, too much about CI and, and when uh, it will be provided or maybe provided, uh, if it is possible to get uh, some support uh, uh, from people which are expert. Yep. And then another question is about, uh, let's say, workflows uh, in CI to get some assistance. And uh, if there is, uh, because in other industries, uh, the, let's say the machine learning is uh, starting to appear. So, uh, for example, in uh, simple repetitive tasks, and I don't know if there is already some idea and some use case uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in this field. Thank you. So, um, unfortunately, our infrastructure is quite a long way off being automated by machine learning. Uh, I would really like that, but <laughs> um, we're not at that point yet. Um, in terms of CI, that was what I had in mind a couple of slides back when I said that we should help projects share best practices. Um, there's a few projects who are already making really good use of CI. Um, it's, yeah, it does need a bit of documentation um, in terms of how to approach it, but probably the best way at the moment is drop onto IRC, hash free desktop, or you know, I'm around here all week. Um, and yeah, we can collate up a list of how people are using it well and what we'd recommend you to do and why. Um, just another answer to this question. Um, I think it's just like code. The best practices are uh, something that you learn by reading other people's um, jobs. So for instance, I added CI support for one project <clears throat> and what I did was just following what another project was doing and which was pretty close to what I was doing and from there I got some things that made sense to me, I applied them and then I, I mean I kept on hacking on it until <laughs> it worked as exactly as I wanted and then yeah I think it, it is going to grow your, your knowledge about uh, testing, it's, it's just like code. Yeah, um, apparently my Wi-Fi is not working, but uh, there, is, there is an issue on, um, on our GitLab about how to uh, collate up some best practices to recommend to people. Uh, I was thinking more in terms of code and how people approach our projects and start contributing to those, but you're completely right that CI really should be part of that as well. So, uh, second, the appreciation for free desktop admins. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in three to five years, do you think the entirety of free desktop services will be provided through GitLab, modulo the community aspects, or are there things that... Mailing lists, like running a high volume public mail server is about the worst thing to do in 2018, because the entire internet hates you. Um, occasionally Gmail verges between skepticism and rejection and accepting our mail and we don't always know why. Um, I can sympathize. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think we've got to keep running uh, mailing lists even though it just gets a bit less viable every year. That, that's the one I'd like to figure out. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you.